It is March 20th, 2012, and we are here today to talk with Mr. Bruce Elton about growing up in Sayville. The interviewer is Library Director Alice Laporte. Yeah, a kid named John Adams lived, his father was assistant postmaster. He lived a couple of houses away from us, and they had a car, an Essex car. And we were forbidden to turn on the radio because it would make the battery go dead in the car. You couldn't leave it on for hours like you can now. So we're in there on Sunday afternoon, listening to the news. And it came over that we had been attacked at Pearl Harbor. As a kid, I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. But I said, I think we ought to tell our parents the country's been attacked. So we didn't get any trouble for listening to the radio. But it was a lot of excitement. And at the end of the war, when Japan surrendered, there was a spontaneous uh, parade of people, uh, fire whistles, church bells. That I remember like it was yesterday. That's interesting. Did you know anyone, uh, your neighbors or family that went into the service for the World War II? I, I was friendly with a few people. Uh, a man named Mel Leach, whose father was a painter, used to paint the schools. He went into the Coast Guard, and they had taken over one of the Vanderbilt's ships, private yacht, whatever you want to call it, and he was stationed at the beginning of the war on that. And then there was another family named Herring on Colton Avenue in Sable. They had a son, Jimmy, who went to Annapolis, who was stationed in the Pacific during the war. Was on a, he was, I think he was on a PT boat, and he was a graduate of Annapolis, and he made a career out of the Navy, and he got to be captain of a submarine. And he would have gone further, but he developed some kind of heart trouble and couldn't pass the physical anymore. And you had some good memories of what rationing was like during the war. Um, did it? How, what did you do for activities as a child in Sable? What did you do for fun? Made a wooden car <laughs> with old bicycle tires and stuff like that. We, all, of course, we all had wooden carbines to shoot at each other. Okay. We shot the Nazis and we shot the Japs. Instead okay. of cowboys and, and Indians. And it was down by the river, not where the ferry is today, but where it used to sail from. That would be on River Road between Irwin Street and River Street. It was a ferry parking lot. And that was a week or two after the war started. It was army guys, army soldiers, living in tents there. They really felt that there was going to be an invasion. And if you had a motorboat, you could volunteer to run the boat and the government would pay you for your gas. And you also had to have the number, the hull number, painted on the overhead of the boat so an airplane could see your number, that you weren't a foreigner or whatever they're looking for. They had patrols up and down the coast here. <sighs> the patrols were, the, for the Coast Guard, the Coast Guard stations were about five miles apart. Okay. I had an uncle that built some of them. And the Coast Guard would start out at a certain time walking towards each other, and they had a key, like a, it wouldn't be a key for a lock, but it was a key, I don't know what it was for, but they had to give their key to the other guy, and he gave him the other key, and then they went back and gave the key back to the commander of the Coast Guard station, which proved that they walked their beat. 
and prove that things were safe. Yes. And you, I don't know if you read any history about when the Nazi saboteurs came ashore from a submarine, they had civilian clothes, dynamite. Have you heard this one? No. All right. I think there's four or six of them. They spoke English with a German accent. They had all kinds of money. So the Coast Guard, young Coast Guardsman, catches them. And they came ashore where? Amagansa. That's out near Montauk. And they were going to blow up Penn Station or something like that. They offered him money. He didn't take it. And he went back and told the commander of the station, who called the Coast Guard, who called, I guess, the police in the city, and they grabbed them when the train came in from Sable. They grabbed these guys. And one or two of them were executed. But there was there were German soldiers, but they were in civilian clothes. Hmm. Okay. Now you mentioned clamming as something you did as a child. Did you do that for the family to eat the clams, or did you do that as a, small, a little business that you had as a child? I did it when I was young for the family to eat the clams, and. When the price of clams went up a little bit, I did it as a summer job. I was a ferry boat captain for the ferry that went to Cherry Grove oh. after I got out of the Navy. And I was also, after that, I was a captain on Tony's barge service, which takes a garbage truck over to the beach. All right, we'll come back to that. but. Uh I want to just talk about um, activities, games you played as a child. I mentioned to you, um, what do we call it on the ice? The um, ice boat. Ice boating. Did you do that as a child? No, um, we didn't have a an ice boat, but we had some friends that had an ice boat, and it's hard to describe. There's no sound or vibration like you have in a motorboat. It's the click, click, click of the runners on the ice. And if you had a good wind, fair wind, you could get over the beach in 10 or 12 minutes. To go from? Sable to Cherry Grove. That would, sounds like fun. Yes. And I've driven a car on. on you on, did? Yes. On the bad, ice? Bad boy, you're not supposed to do that. And we went onto the ice in Belport, it was a ramp there. Got the kids in the car. Go out to the middle of the bay, and I'm worried about falling through with the kids and everything. When you say Here's a guy with a motor home. I don't know what they weigh, but way more than a car. Parked, got a picture window, and he's eating his lunch. When you say you had your kids in the car, you mean when you were an adult you did this? With yes. With children in the car? Yes. Oh, all right, so that was later years. That was having fun. All right. You could drive along at 30 miles an hour and jam on the brakes, and the car would spin round and around. <laughs> and yet you were nervous? Yes, I was nervous. Okay. Because I'd never done it before. Um, the bay provided a lot of activities. Swimming in the summer? Clamming? Uh, swimming. I had a rowboat since I could remember. Oh. Then in... 1939, when I was four years old, my father bought me an outboard motor. It was one horsepower compared to the motors that are now 250 or 300 horsepower. So my boat was very slow. And I used that for a good many years. And then we got to a period where we lived on a boat year round. Your family did? No, not my, my family. Myself, my wife, and our, our children. Oh, all right. We lived at Cherry Grove, because we had the store there. And then in later life, we took the boat to Florida for six months in the winter. Wow. We'll come back to that, too. Okay. Let's stay with the 1940s.
for the for the minute, um, 30s and 40s. Um, what other activities did the children do? The, the hotels that were here, that brought in, as you said, a lot of people from the city. Did you have my earliest memory was when I forget five mile view or something when that burned. Was that a hotel? See, was that a hotel? That was in uh, Blue Point. Five miles from here, from our house in Sable, we could see it burning. And there was a one at, called the Cedar Shore at the foot of Handsome Avenue, four stories, had an elevator. And I was running a water taxi at night. And look over there, and it's burning on the four corners. What year? Around 1960, I guess, 59 maybe. Yeah, I thought it did burn around then. And I'm trying to think, of, I, sometimes I get a senior moment, I forget somebody's name. Webb Morrison. That's it. His father built it. Right. And he lived down there in one of the houses. So if you've talked to him, I can't tell you any more than he. Yeah. The only thing he didn't know that it was on fire on the four corners. Did you? get a job there as a child or as a teen working in the, any of the hotels? It provided a lot of jobs for... When sailors. I was 16, I ran a water taxi. You got to be 18 to get a license. But I ran people that wanted to go from the seat issue up to Cherry Grove. I tell you, I had a speedboat then. So you went from your rowboat to your speedboat. Did you have the one horsepower motor still? No. <laughs> all right. So you... I would take them over two dollars a head one way, bring them back. So that was ambitious? Yes. Of a team to a uh, way to earn some, some money. Um, and, and then around Christmas time, I would go over to an island across from where we lived and saw down birch trees were very thick. Bring them back, cut them into foot long pieces and make yule logs. Drill a couple holes, you got a red candle. And I sold them to a stationery store named Greaves on Main Street. And made enough money doing that for presents for the family. Where'd you get the idea to do it? I saw one in somebody's house. You inherited your grandfather's carpentry ability. Along with his tools. Ah. So that would have been around, you said about 16 you were doing your water taxi, and, um, it, and that would have been 1951 or so. Around then, yeah. And they were doing the U-logs when you were a little younger than that? Yes. Yeah. Um, You mentioned that you wound up going in the service. How old were you when you went in the service? <laughs> I was in Kings, Kings Point Merchant Marine Academy and I got my draft notice from the Army. Okay. So I took it to the captain there and I said, oh, what do I do? He says, raise your right hand take some kind of an oath. He says, you're in the Navy now. So I was what is called a six-year obligator. I had to go to two years active duty, which they sent me on vacation to Africa for a year, and then I was on uh, the USS Forrestal, CVA 59. I was on that for a year, and then I got off active duty and I was in the inactive reserves for four years. Now, is this during the Korean War? Nope. It was after the Korean War. What year? Before was Vietnam. It? Before Vietnam. Yeah. So, 55 to? 57, I was on active duty, 57 to uh, 59. Right. So, you just in between the war years there. Did you, um, were you an officer? Because you came out of the Merchant Marine? No. Okay. 
and you served in Africa and on the ship. You'd go to Europe or the Pacific. Did you get to go? I went on leave to uh, London twice. <laughs> so you come back to Sayville after the service? Yes. At that point, you're still a single man? Nope. Got married when uh, I was right before I got out. Oh, all right. Where'd you meet your wife? You want to know the truth? In the service? <laughs> no, I was at a party and I met her under a piano. Oh, okay. The only place we could get away from the cigarette smoke. Oh, my goodness. And where was that? On base somewhere? It was on Dr. Charlie Rogers' house on uh, Forster Avenue. Oh, here in Sable? Yes. But you were still in the service at the time? Yes. Right. So and she was a Sable girl, too? No, she was a San Diego girl. Uh, I think three or four of them came to teach at Sable. From San Diego? Yes. They knew there were jobs here? That's why they came? For no, the principal called them. He, were, he wanted to get a uh, more well-traveled outlook with the teachers. So he took four from San Diego, San Diego University. And she has an un unusual uh, teacher's license, K through 12. She can do any grade. How long did she teach? Well, she started out at, <laughs> let me go by salary, $4,500. In 1950? And then she, yeah, and then she stopped teaching for a couple of years, and then she went back, and then she went for her master's and got a job in William Floyd teaching special special ed or something, reading. And then we bought a second store, and I couldn't be two places at once, so she stopped teaching, took care of one of the stores. So that was your business, um, store ownership. When did that start for you? 61 or 62. You came out of the service. But I also had three snow, three snow plows going in the winter. So when you came out of the service, what was your plan for yourself as far as work? I wanted to do something with the boats. Oh. Because you had the training from the, from the Merchant Marine Academy. Not really. No? The reason I got involved with the ferry company was when I was 13 years old, I used to hang around in a boat yard. And this guy got friendly with me, bought me lunch. I hand him wrenches. And he was hired to rebuild two engines on a ferry. The ferry had burned to the water line and been rebuilt. So he put rebuilt motors in it. Then he wanted to take it out and test it. Everybody's busy. He's, well, I, he says, I never drove a boat before. I can't take this thing out. I said, well, let me see if I can get a box to stand on, and I'll take it out with you. So I taught him to run a boat. And you knew because of your rowboat? Yeah, I guess so. Well, my father had a boat. All right. And after that, he went into the water taxi business in a big way, with five new Chris Crafts. And he made the trip in 10 or 12 minutes, and the ferry at that time took 45 minutes. So he got a lot of ferry customers. Uh, then Fire and Pine started to grow, and Steins sold out to my friend and kept the Pines ferry. Now, and Steins was a ferry company also? Yes. All right. It's still there today. Okay. And I don't know, I just kept working there. So you worked for him in that taxi service? Yes. Was your, but and you taught him how to drive a boat. And in, in a year or two, being down there all the time, I found out the store was for sale, grocery store. At the Pines? No, nope, at Cherry Grove. Cherry Grove. 
there was, when I was a small kid, there was no pines. There was three or four houses there and a Coast Guard station called Lone Hill Coast Guard Station. We couldn't go any place during the war for a vacation, so we went to Lone Hill, where one of our neighbors owned a house there, for two weeks every year. So there I got to watch the military life, the Coast Guardsmen, watch them launch surfboats. They were, you familiar with that? Yeah. All right. Besides the tower, the watchtower, they would have a building pretty close to, to the surf with a ramp, and they'd roll it out of the, down the ramp onto the beach, into the surf, and then they'd jump in, grab their oars, and row. And that was if there was a ship grounded offshore. It was more, there was more ships sunk and stuff earlier than what I can remember, because there was no aids to navigation, no radar. Oh, sure. The first aids to navigation I can remember is a radio direction finders, where you have the bearing on a station going this way and one going that way, and then when you looked at a chart, you'd know where you were by the that line. Now you got a picture of a little form on the radar screen, which is your boat, and you can see targets. So your family vacation on Fire Island during the war years was that was yes during the war years and once we didn't do that we went to Three Mile Harbor, out on the, by Shelter Island. But your family at some point, you said your grandfather had a house on Fire Island, and then your father built a house on Fire Island. But they, they were destroyed from the... 1938 uh, hurricane. Did they rebuild? <sighs> no. My father sold his lot. It was... The house went out in one piece, and the water was still running through there from the ocean when we went over to the see it. Day. And the only thing that was left was a piece of pipe in the sand. And that pipe was down to the wellhead. We had a pitcher pump. You didn't have running water. And obviously no electricity over there. Oh. So you had kerosene lanterns. You bought 25 pounds of ice from the store, put it in your ice box every day. Um, was it fun? Yes. I tried muskrat hunting in the property that's down by St. Anne's Church. That didn't work out because I didn't skin the skin right. Instead of getting $2 for a piece of fur, you'd only get a dollar. Who would buy it? There was a guy that came around to put from kids. Okay. Muskrat pelts. And I obviously sold them. And this is, uh, uh, part I didn't care for is the animal, <sighs> the trap snaps on his leg. And then he chews his leg off and gets free. So you can figure out what happened, you go to the trap and there's the leg. So I didn't care for that much. What else did you do on Fire Island when, but way back then? Uh, berry picking. Swimming? The, well, yes, no lifeguards. Rough water. It's still no lifeguards at Cherry Grove and Pines. And one time I got carried out, and I'd already been told by my father, if you stay in that current, it's going to weigh you out if you're trying to swim. So just float. Eventually you'll float out of the current, and then you swim parallel to the beach and start to curve in towards the beach. And he while this was all happening to me, he ran on the beach. And when I came in, he was there. He saw you. He said, okay, rest up and then back in. And if he hadn't done that, I don't think I'd swim. Today, I still swim. Any drownings out there because there were no lifeguards and it was very rough? Oh, yeah. 
we sh you still have drownings, but if you dial 911, the cops will bring their patrol car or they'll call up the fire department and the fire department will go down, not go in the water but throw a line to you and pull you in. They're not trained to be lifeguards, so. Right. Yeah. So there was a store at Cherry Grove back in the 40s, when you had and your house, or before the house, actually? There was two ways of groceries getting over there. Bring them on the ferry in a cardboard box and pay a quarter at that time per box. Or there's a guy named Pop Warner who had a big old wooden boat and he had vegetable boxes with ice and he had vegetable displays which he would open up after he tied up at Cherry Grove. Then he'd go to Point of Woods and down the beach every day during the summer. So there was no store at that time? It was just yeah, there was a, well, a store but didn't carry anything refrigerated. Because there's no <laughs> electricity. Yeah. So now this again is the, the dirt electricity the came. Dirt. Electricity came to Cherry Grove, I think, around '55 or so. So we're talking about the '40s. That that, yes. that was the okay. And during the war years, when you vacationed over there, that's how. Yes, and then on high tide, now the Coast Guardsmen had instead of walking the beat, they had jeeps. On fire island. Okay. Yeah. But if it was high tide, they'd come down what we call the Burma Road, which is in the middle of the beach. Okay? Now they come to a boardwalk. It's got a hinge on it. They open it up. Seven foot wide, the Jeep goes through. They close it. Go to the next one. That's how they built them, on purpose. Hmm. Yes. So, catching up a little bit, you come out of the service, and you have a wife and you want to start a career? I just did it with no thought. Which was, you got involved with boats? Is that what? Yes, with, with the ferry and the water taxis and that stuff. And, and this is it, the early 60s now? Yes. And then we found, I found out that the store was for sale, so no more ferry job. We bought, I, don't own the, I didn't own the building. So we bought the lease on the store. On cherry, at Cherry Grove? At Cherry is? Grove. And we had that for 20 years. And I didn't like how I was getting along with the landlord too much. So I said to my wife, if there's ever a store for sale, I'm not going to buy it unless we get the real estate. Buy the real estate too. I pick up the New York Times and I see an ad for a grocery store on Fire Island. Call up and it's Salt Air Market. Big building, nice business. Liquor store is part of it. So we bought that. We were there 10 years. That's around now 1980 or so? Yeah. So you gave up the other, the one on Cherry Grove? No, I didn't give it up. Oh, you kept it? I kept it for 20 years. That's the length of the lease. All right, so you bought the other one? Why? Yeah, when I ran out, I took my equipment and stuff to Salt Air. And in Salt Air, that was built during the Depression. My father, when he was in college, worked there in the summer. And the WPA built the boardwalks, and they built them strong enough to drive a pickup truck on. So if you lived there, you could drive your truck in the winter. No vehicles in the summer. And that's where my kids basically grew up. So the WPA put in the boardwalks all on Fire Island? No, just in Salt Air. Do you know why it was just there? Politics, I guess. I'm, I, I, I couldn't say for sure. Yeah. You lived in Sable at the time that you had the business, yes. the stores on Fire Island. So you just took your own boat back and forth to work? No, we stayed over there. The, oh, because the season was just the season. Yes, at Cherry Grove, we have a house on the ocean. And years ago, when they stopped public drinking at Jones Beach, 
people would take the train and just stay on the train long and come to Sable, and whichever ferry line was shortest, they'd go to Cherry Grove or the Pines. And it got to be noisy and nudie. You know, first it was take off your top. Then it was take off your top and walk around. And then it's take off your top and go to the grocery store. <laughs> so we got away from that and stayed on the boat. And what did we do for recreation? Tuesday and Wednesday we had our weekend. And we would take the boat and go to a place called Barrett Beach. Where was that? That's Talisman. Have you heard of that? No. Okay, it's part of the seashore. The National Seashore? Yes. Down the Atlantic? Between the Pines and Davis Park. Oh, here on Fire Island? Yeah. All right. So you went further down Fire Island on your boat? Yeah. Was it a houseboat? No, it was an old wooden cruiser, 40 foot. So during the season, you stayed in the house on Fire Island during this, because the store closed for the winter, is that? Yes, but in the off season, yeah. the house was empty. We only rented it for the summer. Right. So we'd stay in the house. And then I made it into a year-round house, yeah. put an oil burner on it. So that became where you lived year-round? Nope. No. Okay. Um. We lived in a house in Blue Point. Okay. 5,000 square feet, huge house. And I bought it, uh, I forget what year it was, but when this real estate broker drove up to it, I said, you got to be kidding. She says, you like the inside more. So we went through the house, another broker was there with some wise guy, client, and telling the old man that owned the house, this is broken, this is crooked, and it's falling down. So then I got to talk to him for a little while, and I said, I love it. I said, I only had one problem with it. Said, What's that? I said, I can't afford it for what you're asking for. Well, sit down and have a cup of tea, okay? And I ended up buying it. And uh, the people that own the Bayport Flower House, have you, okay? When this house was built, they were brought over from Germany to the landscaping and stuff. It was a nice old house. And, uh, you know, fireplace in the living room, fireplace in the dining room, another one in the kitchen. What year was it built, do you know? 1905. I have a postcard of it. Uh -huh. Have you talked to Horton? Yes. Okay, he gave me the postcard. Okay. Yes. Gene Horton. Gene came in for uh, a group uh, oral history with um, Emil Pollock. Do you know Emil Pollock? He went to, he graduated from Sable High School in 1953. Okay. Do I know Emil? Sure I do. We're in the same class. All right. Now he's been bringing people in for the oral histories. Yes, and he, he's very up on uh, the Hurtland House and Miss Hurtland. Did know. he talk about that at all? No, he didn't. This is an assisted living, uh, assisted living house in Ronkonkoma, or Lake Ronkonkoma. He's been concentrating on Sable a lot. He's very interested in, in getting Sable history uh, recorded. Well, well, while I'm doing all of this, <laughs> when I was going through the old pictures today, I bought a 22-room stone mansion in Vermont. Wow. It burned 30 tons of coal, and I, it was automatic. You get the coal in there before Thanksgiving because the coal truck if there was snow on the ground, couldn't make it up the hill. It had nine fireplaces, and I had to have a caretaker there. The only thing that was couldn't be automatic was taking the ashes out. From the coal? Yeah. 
How, when, when was that? That was a vacation home for you? Or a My idea was a vacation would be go up there during spring break with the kids, Thanksgiving, and work on the house until almost dark, and then go up. We had a couple snowmobiles race around the side of the mountain until it got dark. Sounds like fun. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the River Road house. Was that your parents' home that became your home? Yes. All right, so that was a family home. Did yes. your father build that, or your grandfather build that one? No. no, there's three houses in a row. They were all one building. And they were barracks for summer help at the Cedar Shore. On River Road? No, the Cedar Shore on Handsome Avenue. Right. The summer help lived in them. They were the three worst built houses, no sheathing, just strips with wooden shingles nailed on them, no insulation. And the last time I rebuilt my father's house, I had a guy, uh, kind of a carpenter type guy, working for me. I was telling him about it. And he says, when they moved, they must have dropped this one because everything is crooked. <laughs> so is your River Road house one of those uh, old That was cut in three, three pieces. All right, so you got, your River Road house was one, because I, I hear that a lot about Sable. They took up, you know, the, the gatehouse of Jones's estate is still there. But then if you drive down, I think Benson, one part of a house, that house used to be something at a oh, hotel, yeah. and the other part was another part they of They did it with horses. <laughs> they, they didn't have bulldozers in to pull anything. And my father told me about a ferry boat that was built up on Lakeland Avenue. Well, I said, how did they get it to water then? Greased planks and a capstan, which is what they used to have on sailing ships where you put a handle in and everybody pushes and wind up the anchor. All right, well they took this dead man, put it in the street 50 or 100 feet away, and the horses walked around, and they pull it for 100 feet. And start all over. So, wow. so it's amazing the amount of weight and stuff they could move. What year did they break up those houses that used to be part of Cedar Shore? Well, it was around, must have been around 33. Do you know what, where the other two went? They yeah, they're right in a row. Oh, now they're in a row on River yes. Road? Yes. Okay. But they're all separate now? Yes. All right. And then your father and got the, one. And the little, the, there was a little bank here called the Oysman's Bank. Yes. They foreclosed on the she Cedar Shore property, and they happened to have foreclosed on the empty property on River Road. So they brought it over. In the Depression. And they sold them yeah. to people. And that became your father's, your father and mother got married what year? 34, I think. All right, so that they moved there. Pretty, they stayed with my grandparents in, on. in Bayport for like a couple months or something. Your grandparents wound up in Bayport? They started out on Lakeland? No, this is the other side of the family. Oh, your, your, your grandmother's side. Uh, my mother's side. Mother's side. And that, the family name there was Lynch. And. My grandfather was Wilbur Lynch, and his, he was a carpenter. And his brother was Arthur Lynch. And yeah. he built some houses on Lower Green Avenue after World War I. And then after World War II, he built some more on Forster Avenue and Popular Street. And he, uh, He's really the first death I remember in the family, somebody fairly close. And he used to bend over in pain, and he got the mustard gas in World War I. And that sticks with you for a long time. Now this is your mother's side of the family? Yes, my mother's father. uncle. Oh, an uncle and her father. They, and they were Bayport uh, residents? Yes, they were, and they were, uh, Great grandmother on a second marriage, marriage married a guy named Seaman. That's Seaman Avenue. Oh, yeah. And he, he owned from Middle Road to the Bay, and it was a farm. At one time, I had his Civil War sword, and I don't know what happened to him. 
people have pictures of him with his medals and stuff. And he had the last freed slave, a guy named Zeb. And I can remember him as a kid. What was Zeb's last name? Do you remember? We had a display downstairs during February, and I think he was a picture of him in it. Could be. Yeah. But that's really stretching it back. <laughs> yeah. But your, your, your mom's family goes back to Civil War days in the U.S. Uh, I don't know what the requirements are for the DAR, but that part of the family goes back, I think, far enough. The revolution. Okay. Yes. Right. So an English family married up with an early... Probably family. Irish. Irish family going back to going back a long time. Long time, okay. And you mentioned living on the boat. That was okay. Something. We went from the old wooden cruiser to when I was thinking about retiring, and we bought a boat for that, a modern fiberglass boat. And we had that for a few years. Took it to Florida in the winter, and then. I liked that make of boat very much. It was 44 foot, and I see one that's almost brand new, or 47 foot. So we bought that, and then we started to have grandchildren. So I bought a 58 foot, which is pretty big. It's bigger than the small ferries and smaller than the big ferries. And we did that until diesel fuel went up to $4 a gallon. I was happy paying 99 cents for it, but when it went up to $4, we stopped taking the boat to Florida. Okay. We still have the boat. I go to Davis Park with it. But you live on land now? Yeah, we live in the house. Not, not, when, not when the boat's in the water. No. We move to our backyard, right on the river. And my wife likes the bird. Life. Okay. What about the house on Fire Island? Do you still have that too? Yes. All right. So you have, sounds like nice places to vacation with the family. Yes. How many children did you and your wife have? Three. Girls, boys? Boy and two girls. And did they stay in Sable? <sighs> My son it lives in Babylon. He runs the Babylon Animal Shelter. It's a political job. Uh, one daughter used to live at 60 Lakeland Avenue, and I sold her the house, and then her husband said, I don't want to work on these old houses. So I had to buy it back. You kept in the family. Good. And she lives in St. James. And then the daughter that comes here, I guess you've seen her. Okay. She lives in West Sable. What do you think of the changes that have occurred in Sable over the years, uh, having grown up, been born here and seen it go through depression and war and changes? It's a better place to live than it was. We never had any crime here or anything like that. The real estate taxes are too high. I'm spending 45000 twice a year for my taxes. On all the different properties? Yeah. yeah. Let's throw it together. But that's too much. Um, you know, the one you see here, I'm trying to teach her to paint. Artistic painting or paint walls? Paint walls. Make a good living out of painting. Well, I got to give up climbing. Give up? Climbing. Yes. I fell off the roof uh, at Cherry Grove and broke my foot. <laughs> so that's no good. So she's, she's trying. Is that a business for you now, painting? Maintenance on our own stuff. 
could be a business, I guess. But boating has, sounds like it's been your passion all your life. I, I've enjoyed that. People that do the same thing I did, you know, take the boat down in the fall and bring it back north in the spring, dreaded the trip itself. They like it when they get there and it's nice and warm. I love the trip. I got so I didn't even have to look at a chart. I mean, 40 some trips. And your wife obviously enjoys the boating life also. To take her mind off of things, when we started out with electronics, she does navigating. Oh, wow. She taught herself? Are, are you running out of film? No, I'm fine. You taught her how to navigate? No, she read the books that came with the electronics. Okay. Natural ability there. Yes. Okay. Um, anything else in your pictures you'd like to share? You mentioned a picture of an outhouse that was left after the Well, hurricane. I don't know whether this will come out or not. This is the outhouse. Mm -hmm. And then here is my father's house. That was on the last walk in Cherry Grove, West Walk. And as I said earlier, when we went over on the ferry to see the damage, the water was still running through there. And he sold that lot for $50. He says, nobody's going to build here again. Oh, wow. And you know, and he said, there's a war coming in Europe, and he just sold it. And there was no surveying. When he sold it, he told the guy that bought it, it goes from here to here. And that was it. Shake hands. And, and that didn't look like much of a house. No, it was very, actually it was very, it had shutters on it. We put the shutters down for the winter. Okay. Looks like one room. Was it one room? No, it was a bedroom. Okay. <laughs> I guess you'd call it modest. Okay. That's, uh, I don't know whether you have any interest in this, if you can see this. This is my parents on a honeymoon. They stopped in Hyde Park, and that's Franklin Roosevelt in there. The president is in the picture? Yes. Oh, it is hard to see here, but okay. They were in Hyde Park. And this is hearsay now, but the Secret Service men wouldn't let them near his limousine open limousine because he was so crippled that they had to carry him in another car. They never, if you look at old nose rails, they never showed him below the waist. Yeah. And that was the reason for it. Well, I think I'm talked out. And I'll go over and see if I have any other pictures. Thank you so much. Okay. This was fun.